Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm sorry I've not really been a around for a, a few months. Um, I've had some IRL stuff, some job stuff, some health stuff, I've been in the hospital, and it's generally not been a very conducive atmosphere to recording YouTube videos. Um, but I'm back, I'm feeling a lot better now. So um, this week we're going to be talking about modern web development. So often I see a lot of CTFs which are well-meaning um, but actually have a lot of poor advice because the way websites used to be constructed like 10 years ago is not really how modern websites are made and particularly some um, uh, bugs like SQL injection are actually really rare now um, but no one really explains why that's the case. So in this video I'm going to be talking about modern web development with a focus on Laravel uh, because that's the framework that I'm most familiar with as I did it professionally as a job um, but it kind of generally why some bugs don't really exist anymore and some bugs that now do exist so before we get on with that let's talk about today's sponsor this video is very kindly sponsored by integrity integrity is a fast growing bug bounty platform so a bug bounty platform means they have targets they have the kind of reporting infrastructure they triage and then they pay out for bugs now because they're growing so fast there's so much opportunity on um, integrity not just on private programs but on public programs as well there's new programs all the time there's always scope changes so there's actually a lot of fresh things to hack you're not sitting there hacking on something where all the bugs have already been found um so you really do have a ton of opportunity on integrity uh i really like working with them not just because they're supporters of my content but actually because they support a lot of the bug bounty community um, they also run things like newsletters and they're now making YouTube videos and they're doing interviews and that means that they're not just like using hackers they're part of the hacker community and that's really important to me I know a lot of people have already signed up and I know some of you have even found your first bugs on integrity or you've participated in the XSS challenges or you've uh, one swag in one of their many giveaways and I'm really so happy for you all if you want to sign up too and join us um, the link is go.integrity.com forward slash katie it's on screen now it's in the video description go.integrity.com forward slash katie um, a sponsorship has really helped me invest more in the channel um, one of the big things I bought was equipment to better improve the audio one of the things I'm looking to do is get like a proper camera set up so you're not just looking at slides, you've also got my face. And doing kind of more um, experimental videos. So uh, some things I'd like to in the future is do things about hardware hacking where I need to buy the equipment but I also really want to show you how you can get started. Now I'm not really promoting them because I think that they're great at giving me money I promote them because I really do think they provide a great service um, and I really hope you give them a lot of love from our community to theirs so talking about money one of the things a sponsorship allows me to do is do monthly giveaways so this month up for giveaway is one lifetime membership to bugbountyhunter.com 10 insider PhD swag packs which include stickers from me um, the both the little logo of my face and then also the kind of expectation versus reality hacker but not just that but i've got some integrity stickers in stock i have some port swigger burp stickers um and any kind of stickers i just put in there that i have that's spare i have five one month memberships to pentester lab pro as well as five two month um try hack me premium membership codes to give away as well so you can enter if you entered the last week's video or this week's video um you kind of get two entries there so this week if you'd like to win what i'd like you to do is to comment on this video with an answer to the following question what is your favorite modern web dev language or tool and i want you to add the text hashtag php sucks with an x um this just allows me to kind of filter out everyone who's not kind of want doesn't want to enter because they already have these things and they maybe don't mind um note that 
because this is a monthly giveaway that you have the entire month to make a comment. You can make a comment on each video that gives you multiple entries into the same giveaway. Um, but this week I'd like to start a discussion on what your favorite modern web dev language or tool is. And if you don't know, say you don't know. Um, maybe you learned from last week and your new favorite language is Bash. You just put on Bash. Uh, it just helps also generate some discussion. So we're not just all shouting PHP sucks into the void um, because no PHP developer cares. So ye olden days, um, how web dev used to be built. And you see this a lot in CTF. So what I did is I went and found a really old project of mine, um, which is very poorly written and is full of security vulnerabilities. But in my defense, I didn't know anything about security when I did it. <laughs> So 10 or so years ago, websites used to be written as pages, essentially. When you visited example.com, it would load up from either index.html or index.php or whatever. Um, like it would load that from the file system and just put it out. Now the way web developers and like web in general works is that you have the HTML, which is kind of rendered out by your web browser. But on the web server, you also have like your PHP. PHP stands for um, hypertext preprocessor. It doesn't mean anything, but the preprocessing is what's important here. So what that means is that essentially the web develop the web server reads the PHP file, squashes down the PHD, like processes it all, which leaves you with just the HTML, which is then sent to your browser, which then outputs the page. So you can do a bunch of different things with this. For example, you can include other PHP files. And essentially, if you saw, you know, example.com forward slash page.php, there would be an actual file called page.php with all that file in. And for example, this PHP file, so PHP in general starts with, um, and this is true now as it used to be, this like PHP thing here. And then we can see we've got include viewbet.php. This is an actual file that exists. And you can kind of see that the file is then read line by line by line. Over here, you can change the header. So this changed the header location to be indexed complete. Um, and all that does is just kind of forward you to another web page, essentially. And you can see this is like generic PHP code. Um, so the best way to think about how HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP, and MySQL works is kind of like a house. So HTML is like the page's structure or building blocks. So if you're describing a house, you say it has a garage, it has a front door, it has a, a bay window downstairs. Um, upstairs, it has two windows, one big window on the front, one smaller window on the side. It has a window in the roof and it has a dormer on top of the garage. It doesn't really matter what color that is. Like I have, I've just told you it's a front door. I haven't told you that it's a green front door or a red front door. I've told you there's a front door because it doesn't matter. You can paint your door at any time. I haven't told you if it's made out of bricks or made out of wood. I haven't told you if it's painted pink or if it's just bare brick. I haven't told you if the garage has windows or if it doesn't. I haven't even told you if it fits a car. So you can kind of think of the HTML as kind of the building blocks of the web page. CSS says what that looks like. So with CSS, we then say the door is green. The windows are um, white. The um, garage door is white as well. The uh, roof is brown. The dormer is dark gray, but the rest of it is made out of bricks. JavaScript then defines how someone interacts with the house. So what can you do in a house where well, you can open the front door, you can open a window, you can open the garage, you can, um, you know, knock on the door, you can turn on the light switch, etc. So that's the front end that defines kind of the house as a structure. The back end is kind of like um, everything else that goes on. So by default, you can see this isn't actually very interactive. Like we're not no way to store the data. We've got no way to kind of understand who's been in the house. 
and um you know did they get there by car or by walking we only care about how they interacted with the house itself php defines that it's like the dynamic content of um the kind of back end and on that we have something like mysql which is our database so the way to think about this is house when somebody walks into the house we should register who they are and maybe where they live and we store that in a book the book is our database our mysql and the process of recording people is our back end our php so i realize that's quite a lot if you're not really sure how the web works but this is vaguely how it works now in old pages if you wanted like a login function that i've written here you know we have login we have an email a password and a submit button and then that would potentially if we add you know our styling so the color um and the padding that would then turn it into this if we then added um the uh, kind of php we could then see if we can log in so that would then create our, our login so you can see here that our form action so this is telling us what php file to run and this is telling us whether or not it's a post method or a get method but you might be thinking but wait i've never seen a php file well there's a lot of ways to remove the dot php ending in files often this is done with something called HD access in the mod rewrite engine so you essentially remove the dot php at the end to make urls look nicer and this is how web dev was done for a really long time but then we realized that we're making the same website multiple times <laughs> we're making a lot of blogs and a lot of stores and that's essentially the same website just copying and pasted so we saw this move to like WordPress and other content management systems or CMSs. So where almost every website needed login, store, blog, comment, content. Um, and we saw the same functionality being built. Something like WordPress or another CMS uh, kind of has this like basic building blocks and then you build on top of it using like a user interface rather than writing raw code. If you do need raw code, you can install themes and plugins and make it all look very different. Um, and this makes it a lot easier to manage, but was really targeted for CVEs and still is really. Like WordPress is full of vulnerabilities. You find the right WordPress version and what you found is a web server that's already been compromised. Now, for like a company making software, there are some problems with this. So the first one is there's no clear separation between what the front end is and what the back end is because PHP code can exist in um, HTML and with HTML. Now, especially over the past like 10 years, we've also seen front end and back end jobs require a really different set of skills. We have more interactive websites with even more JavaScript frameworks like Angular where, you know, most of it isn't done with um you know hyperlinks anymore most of it is done with buttons and all this can be changed and you want users to be able to edit stuff the next problem is that people are really bad at writing secure code like there is so much prob so many problems with this that there are just vulnerabilities included by default it's really easy to slip up and make a mistake we also have accessibility issues so the way um things like google work is that depending on um, their accessibility actually means whether they rank higher or lower on Google. Another move we saw was towards microservices in the cloud. Um, microservices are basically, instead of having um, you know, a single website, you have different parts of your website hosted by different things. And this is where we see the growth of things like APIs. So you can kind of see here that the mobile app will have an API to the RESTful API, which will access the inventory service service. The web browser will have access to the storefront web app, which will call from the inventory service, the account service and the shipping service, which is also called by the mobile app. And each one of these accesses a different database. Now this is kind of combined with technology such as Docker or like deployment onto cloud services. 
but primarily the the kind of value of this is by encapsulating these different functions into different services you can hop swap changes because it actually doesn't matter what um language it's written in like if you are hiring a php developer you can have them support every php service but if you need to write something in javascript you can hire a javascript developer to look at that one you can if that person leaves and you need it to then change to php somebody else can and migrate that to php it's not a case of like um everything's in one file and you've got to look around where things are we kind of separate it out and especially in the development of mobile apps and i said this in my mobile apis video generally you want code to be written once because it's really time consuming to write it multiple times and so what you find is that the mobile app will just call the api and it'll be the same api that the browser calls because the only you only have to write that code once and the api not twice the other um difference has been moving away from procedural code to oop so in procedural code you kind of run the code line by line by line and you just go line one line two line three line four and then if you want to make change how the code works you just add more lines or you move where the lines are however the move has been towards oop so oop instead of defining code by a series of of things you write line by line by line instead you describe objects and then things those objects can do and things they have so for example you define a car and a car will have a color a model a make a year a fuel type you'll be able to start a car stop a car accelerate a car but it actually doesn't matter if that model is a tesla or a fiesta they all kind of go in the same way but a tesla will have the kind of the electric electric engines but the um, Fiesta will have like petrol, for example. Now the other move has been model view controller. So model view controller is a design pattern, which is these like um, set of reusable solutions to problem program uh, problems in programming languages. They're not language um, specific. They're kind of independent because they're ways of doing things. They comes from this book called a pattern language, which fun fact, is also what inspired the sims where you have like architectural styles like there's different ways of making a door but at the end of the day a door has to have specific function about it if you have a kitchen there's it doesn't matter what color the countertop is but if it doesn't have one you're going to notice it more so what we kind of do with the model view controller is we separate out um, the application into classes depending on what they do so we have the model which is our database, our view, which is our HTML, CSS, JavaScript, anything visual, and the controller, which sits between the two, managing it. So it fetches data from the model, for example, which then is, is um, viewed in the view, um, and then it loads up the view for you. So we kind of separate out our HTML, our CSS, our PHP, and our um, SQL into all these different functions. And this is really useful when you're hiring, because if you're trying to make an application and you need to hire one front end design developer, um, you've got to hire a graphic designer, you've got to hire someone to do the back end, they're not all touching the same file constantly and messing up their code. So to do this, we've seen a rise in frameworks. Now these are just some frameworks. Um, there are many other frameworks out there. I've just picked a uh, selection here. We have Laravel, Symfony, ASP, Express, um, Spring, Ruby on Rails, Django, Codeigniter, Grails, Flask, and those are then powered by different languages. So Laravel is written in PHP, so is Symfony and Codeigniter. Flask is written in Python. Grails and Spring are both written in Java. Um, Django is written in Python. Rails is written in Ruby on Rails. MVC is weird. <laughs> Sorry, uh, ASP.NET MVC is weird because it's ASP, which can be C Sharp or Visual Basic. And then we have the JavaScript um, frameworks, which are like mind blowing. And just a quick note on them is that JavaScript frameworks solve a very different problem than some of these backend frameworks do. They actually work very, very differently. 
So the primary drive for them is about user interaction and calling APIs in the background. Those APIs can also be powered by Java, uh, JavaScript, by the way. That's not like limited, but it's just kind of how they work. I'm going to talk about them in another video. So they're out of scope for this particular video, but just know they're a bit weird. Um, and JavaScript frameworks are very, very common. Primarily, if you're hacking JavaScript frameworks, you really want to focus on API hacking. So really do, if you are looking at JavaScript frameworks, uh, take a look at my like many videos on APIs because that's basically how you hack them. So now we're going to talk about Laravel. Um, why Laravel? Well, Laravel represents what a modern framework kind of manages. It's one of, I think, the more popular PHP frameworks because it does things in a really modern way. Now, it's based upon Symfony, and Symfony also does some of this, but Laravel is a lot easier to learn. And because I used to do web development professionally, so before I did my PhD, um, I actually went and did, uh, I worked as like a data scientist and developer, and all of that was done in Laravel. So I know quite a lot about how you'd write Laravel and how Laravel is written professionally versus like um, written writing PHP for a hobby. I used to write PHP as a hobby, then I did it as a job, basically. Um, it's very typical of what modern frameworks look like, and it's my channel, and I like Laravel the best, so I'm going to talk about it. Models. So, models represent the raw data, the object. The best way to think about this is this is the database. Now, when you are um, dealing with the modern web and databases, we actually don't write SQL anymore because our databases are object oriented. So models represent the database side of the application. They don't really do things as much as they do define things. From a developer point of view, you don't write SQL's quer uh, SQL queries manually anymore. You can if you need to, but you usually don't because these use like um, more secure methods of SQL query called parameterized queries. And I'll cover that in a second, but they are not vulnerable to SQL injection. Um, but they are vulnerable to new vulnerabilities that happen because of how um, models work. So the first thing is database creation updating. So in Laravel, we have database migrations. So you basically have database infrastructure as code. There's a general push towards uh, infrastructure as code um, because it allows you to put it in um, like the Git repository. You have version control, you can change it. And one of the advantages for something like Laravel is that you can roll back the changes super easily when you break something. Not if you break something, when you break something. All changes to the database are then tracked and if say for example you're working in a team and maybe you're developing one functionality you've had to add a bunch of database tables um, you're not breaking somebody else's like local version of the application when you commit that because they can just run all the database migrations so usually this is done in like ci slash cd so continuous integration continuous delivery pipelines which is basically when when a developer commits something to GitHub, it will automatically update um, via something like Docker, for example. Um, and uh, both GitHub and um, well, I was going back. GitLab all have tools to do this automatically. So this is why nowadays recon you want to kind of be doing continuous recon because the um, code you're looking at is always changing. So being able to notice where things have changed can actually be really powerful. Now, the other um, like MVC advantage is called entity relationships. Now, entity relationship models have been around for a while, but what... Um, I didn't catch that. Could you try again? So the first thing is database creation and updating. 
So the major change that something like Laravel provides is um, database migrations. So it writes your database infrastructure as code rather than as direct queries. You don't edit the database directly. You write um, migration files, which then can be committed via GitHub. So any changes are then tracked and then even can be used to deploy the database. Um, one major change that we've seen is really CI and CD pipelines. So continuous integration, continuous deployment. And the idea is that you kind of commit your code to GitHub or GitLab and then there's a whole pipeline that happens that automates all of those changes going live. It's why nowadays recon, it's best to do kind of continuous recon and spot changes because you can see where the code is changing because code might change multiple times a day. We also have entity relationships. So entity relationships are actually not a new concept. Um, they are the way people who design databases think about data. So you describe your data by the relationship it has. For example, one to many, many to many, one to one has many through. So a user has many orders, but an order only belongs to one user. A video has one thumbnail, a thumbnail belongs to one video. A student has many classes, a class has many students. An order has many items. Um, a user has an order, therefore a user has many items. And these are all the different types. Um, essentially, you define this in a model and then it's reflected in the database via foreign keys. And really, this is kind of done automatically. Um, so it kind of creates this uh, kind of structure here where you have, um, you know, posts, ID, title, text. Um, and instead of having the like a separate author, you actually have uh, a user ID which represents the author of a post. Um, this is kind of standardly done, but one way of noticing these is seeing something ID. And I've got a um, something I'll be sharing actually in an upcoming video is how to automate finding IDORs using this because there's a really cool way of finding IDORs automatically and following these uh, entity relationships. So what does this kind of mean for you hacking something? Um, primarily it affects APIs. I've talked a lot about API hacking, so I won't go into it too much, but this is primarily how APIs are now written um, because you have entities like posts and users and they have relationships between them. Now, one thing that is completely new is object relational mapping. So an ORM, in Laravel's case is eloquent, means instead of doing the database queries, the data is loaded automatically into objects. And then when you change it, um, you then just save it. So for example, instead of writing select all from user where username is user and password is password, you then have um, this kind of OOP way of doing things, right? User dot dot, which is um, PHP for um, like using a method where username is user and where password is password becomes this kind of like functions instead of this raw SQL. And because you end up defining those um, entity relationships in Laravel, it means you can retrieve relationships super easily. And this is why modern APIs um, are kind of generated a lot of the time automatically rather than manually. Um, a lot of the time, things like Laravel will have automatic code that will do it. I'll put an example in the description from Generic University where I built this functionality for Generic University where it just automatically generates RESTful API endpoints and it's just sorted. Now, the thing to know about ORMs is it really makes editing these easier. Now, instead of writing a query, which is vulnerable to SQL injection, you can now just do save. So make, it makes creating and updating database resources much easier for developers, but it can actually make it vulnerable to new bugs, for example, mass assignment and IDORs. Um, because you're not necessarily aware of what's being updated and what the security controls on that model need to be. So a lot of the time you um, kind of don't really think about the security flaws you end up implementing. And a lot of the time, and this is why things like idols are so common now, um, is because of these uh, like things like models being uh, or ORMs doing this all automatically. So, how do you prevent SQL injection? 
So SQL injection occurs because you can add on parts of an SQL query. Now a common payload you might have seen for um, like logins is all one equals one semicolon slash slash. And all that means is um, it always returns true. So no matter what the other half, for example, uh, you know, seeing if the password is correct, um, it will always return true. And then it comments out the rest of the query, so it just ends. Now instead we see parameterized queries. So instead of just adding text on the end, you have these like question marks. And it basically compiles the SQL, so it knows the entire end of it. So you can't just comment out the rest of it. So when you actually um, try and do it, it just doesn't work. It's kind of like wrapping the whole thing in a string. Um, so now SQL injection doesn't work. So if you're hacking some modern um, web frameworks, this isn't going to work. So how do you actually hack the database layer? So you can kind of see SQL injection becomes very rare, but it's not impossible because while SQL injection has become more rare, there's adding this additional layer of databases actually has vulnerabilities. A common one is query binding. Um, and developers can introduce some vulnerabilities by mistake, like mass assignment, because the databases you deal with are so huge, a lot of the creation of things like API endpoints is done automatically. So actually there's no oversight in how this is being managed. So how do you cause now SQL injection? Now you can actually see exactly what gets run on a Laravel um, uh, like query by looking at this kind of get query log and it will show you how those kind of um, eloquent calls then get squashed down into queries. Queries eventually get run. It always gets run. Um, uh, but one thing Laravel has is DB raw, which does allow you to write SQL injection. So because of that, what you're able to do is cause SQL injection if it uses DB raw. If it doesn't use DB raw, you kind of can't cause SQL injection, but instead you get mass assignment. So by default, eloquent models have a fillable property and this defines everything you can change. Now, it means that every single time you make a database model, you end up having to like tell Laravel the data that can be changed. And if you don't do that, you can't edit a model. So the tempting developer solution is to use guarded. Now, fillable defines what can be changed, but if you have guarded, you define what can't be changed. And you can see how tempting it would be, for example, in this medium post, um, to actually just write everything as guarded rather than using fillable. So developers end up introducing mass assignment because they end up putting in fillable and uh, sorry, guarded instead of putting in fillable because fillable takes too much time. The other one is query binding. So you can actually inject additional parameters into how arrays are deserialized. Um, and this has got the POC here. So you can kind of see um, what the POC would look like, but essentially you are able by doing um, like using uh, arrays that you can like put in uh, the, the query. This is now fixed in the most recent version, but it's a really interesting uh, look into how a database, the database layer is then hacked in, in Laravel and in other frameworks will have similar bugs. Controllers. So how we actually use the models. Controllers are the glue of modern web dev. Controllers are where most of the code and logic is in modern web dev. Um, most of the code in these is kind of similar to older methods of just writing code. Um, controllers will use models and output to views and controllers can also output plain text, for example, in APIs. Now, one of the things you should consider in this, something called routing. Now, this is, I think, working at Bug Crowd, one of the most common things people misunderstand about how modern code is written. So routing is a concept where you define roots, which is your URLs, and then you tell Laravel what code runs it. That means, um, you know, you define a controller and you describe a method in that controller. 
Uh, add one advantage is being able to easily write restful loot, um, routes super easily or add things like rate limiting. So you can edit this really simply. But the thing people misunderstand is that multiple routes can use the same controller. So you can have one API controller which handles multiple routes. So if it does have a vulnerability, even though it's two different URLs, it can still be on the same piece of code because of the way routing handles things. So if you're thinking that can't be a duplicate, that's two different folders. Folders don't really exist anymore. And routing can mean they do share the same code. I'm not gonna say that people are always correct about that because certainly there is a point in like appealing decisions or getting more information, but it can be the case that something that doesn't look like a duplicate actually is. The other thing you see is something called middleware. So middleware sits between the request and the response, um, which is kind of before the request is sent to the controller. Another common duplicate reason, um, you can actually implement in here uh, XSS prevention and apply that to multiple routes. So again, what looks like two different URLs, two different endpoints can have the same code, which will be one middleware file. So often this is primarily used as a access control. It can also check for authentication as well. And this is really important for understanding why some idols happen. Because essentially you can have a middleware which defines if someone's logged in, but not necessarily if they have the permissions to edit something. And uh, I could do an entire video all about how middleware works, but the kind of flow of it is you make a request, it checks if you're logged in. If you're logged in, it makes another request. If you're an admin, then it works. But you can see there that if you're an admin or if you're not an admin, like if you were just to remove that step, you could do anything uh, that should have been done as an admin. And it doesn't actually check that you've got the right uh, authenticated user to edit something. It just checks that you've got authentic you're authenticated, you've logged into any account. And I talk more about this in kind of more practical terms in my IDOR video. I kind of go over the several different types of IDORs that you find. So let's look at an example controller here. So this is a RESTful um, API. So we've got a get the resource name. So here we've got a function index. So this returns whatever model is set and returns all of them. And then we can do a post resource. So we store, we get the entire request and then we've got this model create and then the request input. So this one here is vulnerable to mass, to, uh, mass assignment because we just get whatever's in the request and create a new model with that value. Even if like, it, as long as it's fillable, it's fine. And this one will show everything and it doesn't really have any logic saying it has to be a resource that you control. It can be anyone's resource. A more kind of typical one is over here with vulnerability submit. So this gets the request. It gets um, all of the values from the request, all of the input. And then it gets vulnerability, so it gets and makes a new vulnerability using the uh, information from the um, uh, request. So this one here is vulnerable to mass assignment because we just create it no matter what. This one isn't because we specifically define what's being created out of what value from the request. So vulnerable, not vulnerable. Now you can see here, we return a redirect to a specific route. So this means that we're just gonna to redirect to the home page. This one down here returns a specific view. And you can see here, it returns a view um, with the data of whatever was inputted. So we can do things like error checking. So those are some examples of controllers that you can see. And you can see that the way it's written is quite different to how we would write, say for example, the other, the other PHP. So if we look and look at um, this one, this is the old style of PHP. We can see how different that looks to kind of new style PHP. Um, not only just because one's white and one's <laughs> black in background, but they, they do look different. They're, they're, one is more sleek, it's easier to implement things. So how do you exploit controllers? 
they primarily deal with the logic of the application. You don't really care about the controller, but the logic itself, that's what we're trying to attack. We're not trying to attack the code as much as we are trying to attack the logic that that code is running. So for example, we're looking for mass assignment. We're looking for idols. We're looking for um, issues like XSS. All of those exploit the controller. So some things to note is that controllers usually call templates, views, um, and can be vulnerable to template injection. Controllers may capture the entire request, um, so may be vulnerable to mass assignment. You can see here that this just gets all the input for the request. It doesn't necessarily get specific input values. Um, so there's a lot that you can do to actually attack via the controller via the request that you make. Um, but note that protections can be put like at the site-wide level for example cross-site scripting may well be a um a middleware for example or it can introduce vulnerabilities because of corner cutting like i said i'm going to include some in the description on like how things like idols happen um in generic university so views um and primarily views are templates and template injection the templating engine in Laravel is called Blade. There's many different types. Blade is the one that Laravel uses. The view, as we said before, is the visual part of the website. It contains a mix of CSS, JavaScript, HTML, and it also includes the PHP because it outputs that result from the controller into the visual thing. Um, but there's also additional logic in there, including in PHP. So, for example, if statements, you can kind of see the displaying data here. Um, we send it name and it outputs name, but you can see that this would help security issues because we're only returning the input assert, like that we've, we've described, not additional input. So, inheritance and partials. So, Blade templates have inheritance, you have slot, component, sections, and yield. And essentially components are a reusable piece of code you can use in many templates, pop-up window for example. And slots allow you to pass information to a component. This idea is sometimes called partials um, in other programming languages. The idea here being that often one like um, pop-up can be using the same code. Again, we see a lot more reusing of code, which means that if you find the same issues in multiple parts of the website, it can still be a duplicate. Um, I say this not because it's always a duplicate, but because it's a very common reason people get duplicate and they get quite upset and they get quite angry because they think that for some reason the company is just trying to get out of paying them when actually it genuinely can be one fix. Um, so you kind of have this inheritance as well. So you have here, um, you know, sidebar content, and then you can say this layout extends a different layout. We can put the title in, we can put in sections, we can put in content, and this can all be separate from each other. So, and we can reuse it. So sometimes, um, oh, sorry, PHP and Blade is sometimes controlled by these, these like um, two, curly brackets this by default is filtered in laravel so cross-site scripting won't work now you can remove the filtering by choice by doing curly brackets exclamation point exclamation point to remove it which allows xss payloads to work um, you can also access special arrays for example input which can contain the previous parameters from the post body um, but in the most part it can be hard to find cross-site scripting. And this is, again, I think quite a misunderstood part of modern web development is that actually finding cross-site scripting is not as easy as it used to be because usually it's filtered by default. Um, like as in, it doesn't even reach the developers. It's filtered like way, way, way before it reaches somebody's code. Um, and that's really one of the reasons why I don't actually recommend beginner bug bounty hunters look for cross-site scripting because it's becoming rarer and rarer every year. So you can also render in different languages as well. So developers aren't just limited to placing PHP and HTML, 
but you can place PHP in the JavaScript. So for example, this is I think from generic university where you can define a root name and create URLs dynamically. Um, so it means that we also, once something's fixed, we kind of don't edit it anymore. Um, so often this is why you primarily attack the logic of applications rather than specific parts of it. Uh, the best way to think about it is that quite a lot of this is out of the developer's hands. Um, so you don't necessarily need to worry about it as much. But Laravel and most other templates are still vulnerable to template injection, most common vulnerability. Um, this is a really great example of testing for template injection. So if this works, then you can try this and then determine which template it is and then what to try when things don't work. But for the most part, if it's not vulnerable to this payload or this payload, it's not vulnerable to um, template injection. And what template injection means is that you're running your own PHP code. It's fairly rare, especially in Laravel, but it's worth considering that this is a um, vulnerability that can be found and that is introduced by frameworks. XSS is rare in modern web apps. The framework will usually take control over things. A lot of people will say that it's not vulnerable at all. And that I think is untrue, but one thing to note is it's not actually insecure to store or output an XSS payload. It's insecure to render it as HTML. Like if you store alert one, doesn't that's not vulnerable to anything. It's when the alert box fires that it's vulnerable. So Laravel uses um, the two curly brackets to escape um, XSS attacks. So that's why XSS is more rare in, in modern frameworks like Laravel. So other considerations, Laravel is huge. Like as a framework, it's absolutely massive. And that means there's a lot of different ways of attacking Laravel and a lot of different considerations. One thing to consider is Composer. So Composer is a package manager. If you're familiar with um, Python, you might know pip or npm. It allows developers to include other people's code, specifically at the right version. And what that means is it's actually really hard to find CVEs associated with um, frameworks, not because they're not vulnerable, but because you have to go down this entire rabbit hole. So Laravel Laravel calls Laravel framework. In Laravel framework, you have Symfony routing. In Symfony routing, you have Symfony polyfill PHP 8.0. And then you finally have Symfony polyfill PHP uh, 80, which requires only PHP. So you have to go down this rabbit hole. And that's one. Like you've also got to look for all of these other ones. Like you've got to look at um, all of Symfony here because Laravel is based off of Symfony. You've got to look at things like Doctrine, which is a part of Symfony, as well as like random other things like Swift Mailer. Swift Mailer will have its own list of requirements. So actually finding any known vulnerabilities, you have to search all the composer files and that can be quite time consuming to find CVEs. One great way to bypass this is to just keep an eye on like the framework security notices and look through GitHub and see what changes have been put in place to prevent them um, or if they've been reported. So while you may not see it under the CVE for say Laravel Laravel, you might see Attention Laravel users, please update to this version. When you compare the two, you can see whatever changes have been made um, to see what was actually a vulnerable part of that. I didn't talk about the request cycle that much. Um, it's really useful if you really want to get into like Laravel hacking. There's ones for like every major framework though. Um, but the idea is you, you can find out how slash index.php gets to all of your controllers and what code gets run. I'd recommend reading this and finding something similar for other frameworks, just so you have an idea of what is actually happening behind the scenes. Now the common Laravel bug is exposed.env files. EMV files are the configuration files for Laravel. 
and they shouldn't be committed and by default they aren't committed um they when you install laravel it comes with a git ignore and that specifically ignores env files they contain database information for example database credentials um, if you're doing source code reviews or kind of like um, GitHub, Google Dorking, um, always keep an eye out for .env because as you can see, you can have access to the database, you can have access to um, uh, Redis, you can have so many different accesses from this. Um, and there's even more functionality. Like I've barely scratched the surface of how Laravel works. Laravel, you can write console commands, you have events and notifications, you have file storage, mailing, you've got the uh, queues, default rate limiting, task scheduling, encryption, and that's not even starting on third party tools like, for example, IDE Helper. So the amount of functionality that's actually included in a default Laravel fun uh, like install is huge. Not to mention there's also Lumen. So Lumen is a micro framework, which is based off of Laravel. Uh, and it's used for very simple APIs, which don't have a lot of backend logic, which includes things like routing, controllers, middleware, authentication, mailer, queues. You can enable Eloquent. Like this is a whole other thing to consider, which is micro frameworks. You've got WAF. So while Laravel's filtering is very good, it doesn't necessarily always work. So not only do you have um, the filtering by default, people can install filterings. Um, they can use regex patterns. Often you can look in the source files, uh, the config files to find the source of like what's actually being extracted. For example, like this, you can see here that even if you write a DB raw query, that you can actually filter out, you know, union select um, or delete or select automatically using a WAF. And on reflection, <laughs> the modern web is very different to what it used to be 10 years ago. And I think it's a mistake for a lot of bug bounty hunters to pretend that it's not. The kind of bugs that we saw, like even, you know, two years ago as kind of suggested beginner bugs just aren't the same anymore. Cross-site scripting is much rarer. SQL injection is much rarer. And even if you find things, they're going to be essentially zero days. Now, can you find zero days? Yeah, totally. Can you find them reliably? Not necessarily. And I think this is a big um, kind of issue in how like Laravel works and how all modern frameworks work, which is that actually hacking them, you have to rely a lot more on the logic put in front of you, the business logic of an application. You have to look for idols. You have to be on the lookout for business logic flaws. You are looking for bugs, which essentially attack the functionality rather than the language of an application. And that's, I think, the major change in kind of this move to modern web that we see. So with that in mind, thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope you found this interesting and if not, a good like fun rant on how the web has changed in the past 10 years i want to thank our sponsor integrity again um i really don't take an advertiser having an advertiser on the channel very lightly um i really genuinely think they do amazing things for the community and it really has allowed me to make investments in my channel like improving the audio improving the editing one reason i really like working with them is because they care about the community they not don't just see hackers as like money like people who make the money they actually want to invest in the community and, and put a lot of thought into how they can invest and, and help um, improve the community over time so do give them a lot of love you can sign up with my link on screen so go.integrity.com forward slash katie i put it in the video description as well do not forget that if you would like to win uh, our monthly giveaway we're giving away one lifetime membership to bugbountyhunter.com 10 packs of insider phd swag which also includes stickers from integrity and portswigger five one month memberships to pentester lab pro and five two month memberships for try try hackney premium Ooh. if you'd like to win um comment on this video with an answer to what is your favorite modern web dev language or tool and the text hashtag php sucks with an x so that is what your favorite modern web 
modern web dev language or tool is and the text hashtag PHP sucks. Um, you can write a comment on each video coming out this month and it will all count as unique entries to win. Uh, so do put a comment on each video and keep an eye out for the next one for even more chances to win. Thank you very much everybody and I will see you all next time.